What is cold in here? Jeez Louise. Trying to fizz us out? We're hunting Nazis. Tell you what, it's a bad day to be a nappy. I think we're like this. I have a party. Jeterius is here. I think this is there. My fault. I had to go let my dose on this. Where is everybody's work? I don't know. They don't like our class. It's a bad day to be a Nazi. Because we're going Nazi hunting. That's what it was hard about. I don't want that. Hey, I 
What I say? It's a bad day to be a Nazi. Hey, Asmund said, "Is it ever a good day?" And that was a great response. No, it's never a good day to be a Nazi. But today, in this class, we are going Nazi. Now remind me, where did we leave off yesterday? Where did I leave you yesterday? The attack on Pearl Harbor. Aha, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Where was that located? Hawaii. 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 And if we were to say the theater of war that was located in, what theater of war was it? Excellent. The Pacific Theater of War. So the Pacific Theater of War is what drew the United States officially into World War II. To declare war on Japan. Well, Germany... In subsequent, declares war on us, so we declare war on Germany, and there we have it. We are involved in World War II, and the first thing that we do is go and fight in Europe. Wait a second. We just got sucker punched in a surprise attack by the Japanese in Hawaii. Why are we going to go fight in Europe first? Huh? I'll hear that. I mean, a little. we could elaborate a little bit on that. Why we they want to have as much stuff. Uh, opposite of that, they have more stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it was actually deemed that Hitler and the Nazis were the greater threat, they and were. we were going to go fight in Europe first. Now the idea was <laughs> that as everybody fights in Europe, France, Britain, Russia, United States, we fight in Europe, we win in Europe, and then all four of those countries are going to go fight in the Pacific. That was the strategy. As it actually played out, we really kind of fight two wars at the same time. And that is the whole point of our vocabulary saying the Pacific Theater and the European Theater. Well, if you look at the top of your notes, you see your very first phrase is the European Theater. So here it is. Want to distinguish between the two areas of fighting in World War II. Now, I know when I say theater, you guys think about movie theater. Or maybe if you're culturally refined, you think about a stage that is a theater. That's not what we mean from a military perspective. Military perspective, a theater is an area of operations. In the present day, right, I try to make it comparable to the present day for you. The war in Iraq was a theater, and the war in Afghanistan was a separate theater. So for about 20 years, the United States was fighting in two different theaters of war. Well, here in World War II, we have ourselves focused in the Pacific, where the enemy is who? No, you guys are right. Japan. The Pacific, the Pacific, the enemy is Japan. Japan. Good. You got to connect those two together. And then now today we're going to be talking about Europe, where the enemy is European. The Nazis. The Nazis. Hitler's Nazi Germany, and to a lesser degree, the Kingdom of Italy. But European theater is always going to be referencing fighting the Nazis in Germany. So that is why I'm kind of selling it over the top here and trying to help you remember that the European theater is all about fighting the Nazis in Germany. Now on the screen here, uh, the picture I have highlighted in green is the European theater. Europe. That's the whole continent of Europe. So I'm uh, just distinguishing from Africa and from Asia. Highlighted in <laughs> green is Europe. And quite frankly, guys, the fighting in World War II happens all over those places. We're going to be talking about some specifics, and in the end, I'll show you a map where all the fighting happened, and basically all that highlighting green, and even arguably a couple more areas, that's where the fighting happens in the European theater. Wait, why so wide-scale fighting, not just two countries, not just one region, very, very, very wide-scale fighting. In the end, the fighting in the European theater, here's the results, here's the impact, right? We always want to know the why. The why for the fighting in the European theater is that these countries needed to be liberated. Hitler had conquered them, and they needed to be liberated. And those countries are England, France, Belgium, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and even a couple of other smaller regions. So that's the big reason that we went to war in the European theater. That's the upfront. I'm going to tell you all about it in small pieces now. Devin, what's your question? Why did they like expand the fight? Why didn't they have it? Great question. I'm going to explain all that to you right now. So first, my world historians might remember we did kind of a whole class on Hitler at one point. We discovered that Hitler was born as a, uh, not a Jew. baby. He was born as a baby. I actually showed you a picture of baby Hitler. And some of you were like, oh, I, thought, I thought he was born the evil adult. 
Hitler was born as a baby. Hitler had parents. Can you imagine being the parents who raised Hitler? Of course, you didn't know you're raising Wait, a world. Actually, I was, you know, there's a story about him. He was in a war and he got shot, and someone from our side actually saved him. So this is true. He was a soldier. He was wounded. He actually was uh, received some awards for valor. He also had another really unique attribute. What was it that he actually wanted to be in life? A leader. An artist. Good job, Andy, from left field. Hitler wanted to be an artist. He changed career. Was that Keaton? He changed career. Keaton or Andy? Who said that? Andy, good job. But he was what? <coughs> what, what? Where did his art career go? It didn't go anywhere. Because? Because they became a leader. Huh? He got burned down. From? Art school. That's good. Right? All of you had together. Hitler got rejected from art school not once but twice. What if Hitler had been accepted to art school? Do you think the world would be different? Then yeah, this would yeah. We don't know. We don't know, right? But Hitler was rejected from art school twice, and it leads to him becoming the leader, the dictator that he was. So here's a couple of thoughts on Hitler. Not going quite as deep as we did in world history class because we got to get to the U.S. history part of World War II, not just the world history part. So do write this down under Hitler. He's on your screen there, on your page there. He was named Chancellor of Germany in 1933. He creates a totalitarian Nazi government, totalitarian, super important word, and he demands Lebensraum for the German people. Now, that is a foreign word, and I have to explain it for us to understand. <coughs> Lebensraum is actually Austrian language, and it literally means living space. His belief was that the Aryan people, white skin, blue eyes, blonde hair, was the perfect human, right? We all know about Hitler's racism and, of course, his prejudices. Well, Hitler believed that the perfect race needed more space to live. And you got to kind of take it back all the way to World War I, where Germany lost a lot of territory. Hitler believed that he deserved to reconquer those areas. If they are ethnically German and the German people need, need more living space, then he gets to reconquer the former territories of the German Empire. Hmm. Sounds like everything running on CNN and Fox News right now, just with a couple of different countries involved. You catch that? Mm -hmm. What's going on in the world right now? Russia, Russia's uh, trying to get uh, Ukraine. They're trying Ukraine. to swallow Ukraine. And what's Russia's justification? That they are ethnically Russian regions oh, of the world. So. When you study history, you can see it repeat itself. What we're talking about as it relates to the 1930s leading into the 1940s with Hitler and Germany, we're actually seeing it happen again with Putin and Russia. And his justification is almost like a copy and paste. It's almost like a plagiarism. He says, hey, ethnically Russian regions, I'm going to recapture them. Just like Hitler said, hey, ethnically German regions. You know, so Putin wrote this very lengthy essay, about, about a 5,000-word essay justifying his actions and essentially citing the uh, Russian ethnicity of some of these regions. I don't think he cited, I don't think he cited Hitler. I don't want to speak like I don't know because I, I haven't read the whole essay. I don't think he cited Hitler. But for historians like ourselves, we can definitely see the similarities. It's like, that's a good thing to do. Ukraine was uh, taking Russian black trucks and all. And That's exactly right. Hey, Slade, you're exactly right. I'm glad you're keeping up with the news. The Ukrainians are fighting very heroically right now. And in fact, every time a Russian tank breaks down, they fix it. And a lot of Russian tanks are breaking down because Russia has outextended its supply lines. They have outpaced their supply lines, which means they can't feed their soldiers and they can't fuel their trucks. Really? Ukraine. So every time that a tank just runs out of fuel, a lot of times the Russian soldiers just leave it there. They go and hide. They go and escape or they go back with their unit. But they leave the tank there. So you know what the Ukrainians are doing? They're, they're pulling out John Deere tractors. Like this is the best advertisement ever for John yeah, Deere. They're pulling out John Deere tractors, hitching it to the tanks, and it's basically showing how powerful a John Deere tractor is. And they're just tugging it back to their their lines. Presumably they're going to fix it up, mechanic it, you know, put it, put some fuel in it, and use it against the Russians. And just like you said, paint the flag on it as well. There's also a TikTok video of an actual like a blue tractor TikTok. pulling that crazy. Pulling a, a tank. German tank yeah. all the way from wow. Ukraine. Wow. Whatever it takes, TikTok or otherwise, the fact that you guys are paying attention to the news, good job. Right. Because we see a lot of similarities in what we're talking about today. Devin? All right, I have a question about that. 
Was, was there people like during his time in this country that didn't like him and try to rebel against him? Uh, yes, but they were one, a minority, and two, uh, they'd be prosecuted, persecuted if they did. So it's a situation where they would have been, uh, yeah, attacked, jailed, something like that. Uh, so it's very difficult to speak out against Hitler. What you got? What's wrong with shoes, Jasmine? Why are you being a racist? We can fly right now. I'm not scared of you. What? I carry a gun. Okay. I carry a gun. Hey! Do I got to review the film? Yes, please. All right. Actually, no, I have another question. Laban Strom, it's not on your notes. I'm just kind of building an understanding for you here before we dive into the U.S. portion. Laban Strom means living space. Hitler uses this to justify, as if you can, to justify him gobbling up certain areas. Those areas include Austria, 1938. Hitler actually is Austrian, native Austrian. He becomes German. He's basically a German immigrant. So he really thinks that his native land, his home of Austria, deserves to be German. So he gobbles up Austria. He additionally gobbles up this region called the Sudanland, which is a stepway, kind of like an open door into the rest of Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia is a democracy. The fact that Hitler gobbled up a democracy should have really concerned the rest of Europe. And Europe was concerned, but I'm going to tell you how they dealt with it here in just a second. Devin, what's your question? What was Hitler's religion? Um, that's a good question. I'm arguing, like, like, I was thinking atheist or agnostic. He hates Jews. Yeah. So, and like, I, thought, I would argue atheist or agnostic. I'm sure someone has studied that. I don't quite have the answer. Let me show you the map here. Let's the the Let me show you the map here. So this, the dark green is Germany. This first little region, this is between France and Germany. It's called the Rhineland. He invades this area, which he's not supposed to. It's a demilitarized zone. Following World War I, seeing as how much France, you know, France took a beating from the Germans, they make this region called demilitarized. What is not able to go in a demilitarized zone? Military. Military troops. Well, Hitler violates that by entering the Rhineland. So that's step one. Step two, he takes over Austria. Step three, he enters the Sudanland, which is this very narrow strip of land. But like I said, it's the doorway to Czechoslovakia. And then eventually he evades all of Czechoslovakia. So think of it as like one step at a time. Step here, step there, step there. So like island hopping. Like island hopping, but with regions. I'll buy that. I like that. However, the way that the rest of Europe reacted to him, I like to think of it as bad parenting. Because here's what the rest of Europe was saying. France and the UK kind of as leaders of Europe. Hey, bro, don't do that. Oh, but for real this time. Stop. We mean stop. Again? Dude, no more. My point is, they were not very strong in their condemnation of Hitler. So, if I were to parent my child like this, let's say it's dinner time. Y'all know Sayla, she comes in here, she's not coming in today. Sayla comes in here, you know she's off the wall, and you know she can be very persuasive. But we're coming up on dinner time, and she wants a lifesaver. Tiny little, tiny little candy. Is that going to ruin her dinner? Yes. I don't. I'm not supposed to let her have candy before dinner, according to my wife. Maybe. But let's say I, I, I let that one slide. All right. There's your little life saver. Well, Sayla, persuasive and persistent, and like never letting things go. It's now good. she wants a Twinkie. She comes up to dad and asks for a Twinkie. We're so nasty. If I'm a bad parent, I say, okay, 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 but no more, but no more. She eats her Twinkie. Dinner's getting closer. Now she comes up to me and we got cupcakes. She wants a cupcake. So if I'm a bad parent, I say, okay, but this time is really the last time. Right? I mean, I know I said that last time, but this time is really the last time I give her a cupcake. And on and on and on and on. That's bad parenting, right? That's basically what Europe did to Hitler. No. Okay, but now I really mean no. No more. No, but we meant it this time. No. Bad parenting. Now the fancy word for it is appeasement. And it's almost like that as if they just kept giving one more step into the next, appeasing Hitler. Picture here, this is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Britain. And he's got this little wispy little rat-like mustache. I'm going to show you a picture here in a second. I think he's like a weasel. I think he's like a rat. And that mustache just kind of highlights it. Well, the tightrope here is the idea of appeasement, the fact that they're just giving up one after the other to Hitler. And what it's saying is if the appeasement snaps, well, what's he going to be facing? He's going to land on the bayonets of the German and Italian empires. 
So it is saying that impeachment is walking a very dangerous line, and it might, yeah, it might snap, and that means that all of Europe is going to be thrown into war. Well, of course, we know that's what happens. He didn't know that that would happen, but we know that that's what happens. Here's a picture. This is Neville Chamberlain. See that mustache? He sees like he's got that. It's almost like a weasel, it's like a rat with that high upper lip. Well, he is shaking hands with this evil, evil man, Adolf Hitler. This is at a conference called the Munich Conference, and basically what they're agreeing to is everything Hitler has gobbled up so far, he gets to keep, and there will be no more. But they're giving up people's homelands. They're giving up Czechoslovakia. They're giving up Austria. They're just letting Hitler have his way. You can see how all these steps have let Hitler grow in his strength. One more analogy for you. Are you guys familiar with that old children's bedtime story called If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? Well, if you give a mouse a cookie, what's he going to want? Water. A glass of milk. The story says a glass of milk, which is more. Yeah. So I like to say appeasement is bad parenting, or if this analogy works for you, appeasement is like if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. So really setting up Hitler to be powerful by letting him have gobbled up all these different chunks of land. Really important to the American involvement in just a couple more steps. Fast forward here just a little bit. The Nazis and the Soviets make a pact together. Wait a second. Nazis are fascist. Soviets are communists. Those are different political ideologies. Why in the world would Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union make a pact together? Power. Power is a good thought. More stuff. Some more stuff. Some kind of shared stuff. Yeah. Oh, if or they make a pact together, they can't fight each other. That's it. That's it, Devin. Yeah, Even though they're not that. exactly friends, they make this pact together to not fight each other. It's called non-aggression. We don't like you, we're not friends with you, but I'm making a pact with you for non-aggression. What's up? You want to stick more? Yes, please. Okay. All right, now back to what I was saying, John. I'm sorry. Did I scare you? Don't say anything else. Yeah, non-aggression. So that might have that might have been an alliance between the two most powerful countries in Europe. And I like someone said share stuff. You know what they're gonna share? They so agree much. that if they ever have to invade Poland, they're gonna, yeah, we're just gonna split Poland between them. But they don't. Just split Poland between them. Why, why, why would they care about Poland? Well, they're giving up people's livelihoods here, right? You're attacking someone's home, and you'll be like, ah, you know what? We'll just split it amongst ourselves. There's a lot of reasons why they want Poland. It's a port, there's port cities, there's terrain. The idea of Lebensraum, right? Hitler wants more to stand up. In general, more work. land? Oh, just more land. Huh? More land. Just more land in general. That's right. Now, they didn't invade Poland immediately, but dun, 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 the Nazi invasion of Poland, September of 1939. A lot of people would say this is when World War II in Europe actually began. I told you yesterday there was some like Japanese fighting in China way in the early 30s. Some people say that's when World War II started, but the big fighting in World War II started right here, September of 1939. Do you want to know the story? Tell yeah. me. Oh, it's a good one. Tell me. It involves... Death row inmates, yes. can we, lying, can we act it out? cheating, yes. espionage. We're not going to act it out because I am trying to get to a movie clip I want to show you. Here's what happens. The Germans, the Nazis, they take a, a group of death row inmates. These men are on death row. They're set to be executed. They take them to a German radio station that's just, let me click back to my map, just on the border, just on the border of Germany and Poland. Here it is, perfect on the border of Germany and Poland. You can see they share a border. So they take these death row inmates, it's on the German side of the border, it's a German radio station. They dress them in Polish army uniforms. Well, if they're in Polish army uniforms, what are people gonna think that they are? They're just our guards. Polish soldiers. Here's what they do next. They line these men up, they, open, they turn their guns on them, and they go, kill them. So now you got a bunch of dead guys yeah. in Polish army uniforms. What are people going to think happened? Our country turned on Poland invaded Germany. 
Further, they continue the espionage, the intrigue a little bit. They get on their own radio station, right? They're, they're capturing their own radio station. They get on this German radio station, even in the Polish language. They say, we are the Polish army and we are invading Germany right now. We are, attention, attention, we are the Polish army and we're invading Germany right now. Well, when the dust settles and when the newspaper reporters and photographers come out, what do they see? A dead guy. Old, a bunch of dead guys wearing old, 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 Polish old. army uniforms. So the story that gets told, it's Polish a lie, invaded. but the story that gets told is that the Polish invaded across the border, and they killed them. attacked our radio station. Not that they killed themselves, but that there was a battle. The Germans say that they killed the Polish guys, but now here's the think about it. I see your hand in just a second. Here's the, th here's the thing about this. If someone invades your country, what do you have the right to do? Kill them. Defend yourself, right? Kill them and defend yourself. So what Hitler is going to say, now he is in on the lie, okay? Don't think that he didn't know what was really going on. Hitler says, last night the Polish army invaded Germany, and this gives us the right to attack Poland back. He uses it as an excuse to invade Poland. Uh. Now history will tell us it was a lie. We didn't know that right away. History will tell us that it was a lie, and of course that just kind of adds to how evil Hitler was overall. Andrea, question? Well, they were death row inmates. So oh, basically, they were prisoners. Uh, yeah, they were prisoners. So sacrifice. So it's basically like, hey, put this uniform on. Hey, stand here. I don't know if they put a blindfold on them or whatever, but they were inmates. They were prisoners. They were not under their own free will. The soldiers who did the shooting, Taylor had a lot of kind of like superhuman, extra roided up soldiers who were willing to do whatever he wanted. So it didn't matter that it was murder. It didn't matter that it was kind of against your morals or your values. You know what? A lot of Hitler's soldiers weren't really thinking clearly. They were just following their leader. Good question. Good question. So that is the intro. That is the like lying, cheating, stealing story of how World War II started. It kicks off what is known as Blitzkrieg. Do I got any footballers in the room? You want some football background, Devin? When you're blitzing on defense, what are you doing? Okay, so you're uh, uh, running at the quarterback, but at what speed? Oh, very fast. Fast. Like nonstop. Oh, blitz. Okay. I'm going to teach you something. Blitz is actually, actually two names. Blitz. blitz. Stand up. Blitz, so, blitz is the German blitz. word for fast. Blitz is the German word for fast, or lightning, rather. Blitz is the German word for lightning. Creed war. Lightning war. So when you're blitzing on defense, you should actually think about the word lightning. Blitz means lightning. Lightning fast, lightning war. Blitzkrieg, you've heard that before? you heard that before? That's awesome. She's I'm glad. She's Other glad. classes are helping me out. Blitzkrieg means lightning war, and what it means is that they swept through Poland. Right? Light resistance. They didn't stop for anything. They just cut right through Poland like a hot knife through butter, and it led to a quick German victory. Well, now, finally, old weasel lip, right? We have Neville Chamberlain with his nasty little mustache. Oh, yeah. Now he was willing to draw the line and say enough's enough. This is when Britain and France finally declared war on Germany. But think about it. If they hadn't let him do all those other baby steps, maybe he wouldn't have gotten so powerful in the first place. But finally, finally, Pol or, uh, uh, Britain and France declare war on Germany. So now here we have it. Germany takes all these tiny areas, invades into Poland. And I'm going to show you another map in a second that kind of shows how much they gobbled up. Uh, all uh, right, leads me to, this is still context, this is not on your notes. France has something in place called the Maginot Line. France shares a border with? Ah, this border right here was the scene of what? A lot of blitz. trench warfare in World War I. See, France, they already got spanked once in the first World War. They determined never to let this happen again. So what they do on their shared border with Germany is they build up very strong fortifications. You see the key here? Very strong fortifications. Yes. Along the rest of their border, they have light or weak fortifications because they are friends with Luxembourg. They are friends with Belgium. They don't anticipate that they would ever get attacked across this portion of the border. What if they did? Well, Hitler knows that, so here's what he does. Here's the Maginot Line. Massive defenses. You can see these bunkers with machine guns and soldiers. Like France said, we are not going to get invaded from Germany again. So they built up their defenses like this. 
Defenses built along France's border after World War I. Well, here's what Germany does. May of 1940, 40, Hitler's army moves through Belgium. Watch this. Germany, they don't go through, kind of hard to see. They don't go through the Maginot Line portion. Let me go back here. They don't go through the Maginot Line portion. They violate Belgium. Okay, and that's called vi that's violating a neutral country. They violate Belgium and they come through France right here on the wheat fortifications. And what they do with Blitzkrieg, they steamroll all the way to Paris. And if you capture the capital city, a lot of times that's the same as you captured the whole country. Much like we see in Ukraine right now, the Russians are trying to capture the capital city of Kiev. Well, they reach France in about 10 days. The French surrender. And that's kind of why France has a reputation of surrendering very easily. They didn't really fight back very hard. I don't want to judge anyone. I wasn't there. No, but me, history kind of says that France just what rolled over. They didn't really resist all that hard. Wait. Whereas today we see the Ukrainians are resisting in the streets and they're not letting the Russians roll through. Wait, so after 10 days, they didn't realize they were going to invade other than that um, one No, they, I'm saying they came through. They came through Belgium all the way to Paris in about 10 days. Oh, awesome. So it's kind of like the first 10 days of the Ukraine war, but for the for, in this case, that means that they conquered all the Are we gave any tanks or anything to Ukraine? I'm not talking about that right now. No. So here is the situation at this point in the story. Germany is now all yellow. They have captured these regions. They have uh, violated Belgium. They have captured all the way into Paris and the west coast. Yeah, the west coast of France right here. There is a free zone of France. Okay, some portions of France was able to resist, but all the way through to the capital, Paris, they did not resist. That leads to, and so so this is the setup right now. This leads to something known as the Battle of Britain, because see what Germany does not have right now is London. Britain, being an island nation, Germany would have to like cut across the water, they'd have to use their airplanes or their airborne troops, something like that. They are not yet in control of London, and in fact they never will be, but they try to be. They try to be in control of London, this is called the Battle of Britain. And what it is, is over the course of a year, May of 1940, all the way to May of 1941, the course of a year, they bomb London on a daily and nightly basis. They are trying to bomb Britain into submission. German Luftwaffe, that means Air Force. Okay, the German Air Force makes daily, nightly bombing raids over Great Britain. There's a unique, it's a unique time in history where technology is on the rise. Radar is a new technology that is able to help the, uh, the Britons kind of defend their city. You know radar, like think about it. Yeah, well, battleship, yeah. Boop, bleep, boop. Yeah, so instead of just waiting to see the airplanes on the horizon, at which point we really wouldn't have much time to react. Now they have radar that can tell when the Germans are inbound, and that means that they can blow their air raid sirens, they can get to their bunkers, if they got their anti-aircraft weapons, they can point them at the skies and start shooting guns. So this radar is a very important development that able to, uh, that's able to help the Londoners fight off Hitler. Here's a real important takeaway. They didn't cave. They proved that Hitler could be beaten. France rolls over. All the other countries, like Czechoslovakia, Austria, Poland, they just rolled over. But the Londoners, they proved that Hitler could be beaten if you didn't just give up. That queen on. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures of the Battle of Britain, and they're kind of sad. Everybody was affected, not just the military, not just soldiers, but entire families. Kids like this, you see he's got his little stuffy there? They have to go to the bombing shelters just like everybody else. What a time to grow up, right? You're supposed to be nine years old, having fun, playing outside, but you gotta run to the bomb shelters on a nearly daily basis just to, just to stay alive. Another picture here shows kids in a bombing shelter, right? We don't live like this. You, got, you guys didn't have to grow up like this. How is that a bombing shelter? Well, I'm not getting into the whole picture. It's below ground, it's kind of like a trench line. Oh, yeah, that's right. Others were like actually concrete buildings where they shut the door and all that. You said with a grenade, it blows up. That's right. Up and out. Bombs blow up and out. Here's an actual picture of uh, kind of the, the after effects of the bombing. Now imagine wow. this happening on a daily basis. Double decker bus cratered into the ground, even the subterranean subway type areas, right? Imagine this happening on a daily basis. This was the Battle of Britain. This is what was happening in London. Yeah, and also one more. So another thing that happened during this time period is some children stayed with their families, stayed in the cities. A lot of adults stayed in London. 
they carried on with their daily lives. This is where that motto, keep calm, keep calm and carry on, comes from. The British government was saying, hey, we resist by continuing our daily lives. Go to the bomb shelters, take cover when the, when the sirens go off, but we got to keep living or else what do we have going on in our country? That's for the adults. The children very often got put on trains and got moved to the countryside because the, the bombing wasn't happening in the countryside. The bombing was only happening in the urban areas. So look at this. Dozens, hundreds of thousands of children, they got tagged, and very often they got sent to be with auntie, and you know, auntie and uncle who live in the countryside, or even orphanages. They would just get moved to the countryside. Reason for children being protected like this was because children are the future. Yeah, so they wanted to protect their next generation of children. Now, a little bit of a cultural crossover here. Anybody familiar with these characters who are on the screen right now? Who are they? They're from a movie. The movie's from a book. Oh, it's just a bank These are the Pembasy children from the story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Now, obviously, that's kind of a magical story where they find their magical wardrobe. But hear me on this. The reason that the Pembasy children, the reason that the story starts, is because these children are getting put on a train, just like the picture shows, they're getting put on a train to go live in the countryside with their auntie. And at their auntie's house, this is where they find the magical wardrobe, and that's the rest of the story. But some, you see how literature connects with history? It's during the Battle of Britain, the bombing of Britain. Yeah. What's that? There's also a movie. Yeah, there's several. Yeah, that's a movie. I think there's several movies because there's several books. Anyway, just a little cultural crossover. Uh, Winston Churchill, he is the leader who replaces old Ratlips, right? Well, uh, Neville Chamberlain is replaced by Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill is actually not a great guy. Morally speaking, he's a drunkard. He tried illegal narcotics. He was born of an unwed mother. So for a lot of people, that was, you know, a lack of morality in his raising. But here's what I give to you. Here's what it goes to show you. It doesn't matter your background. You can still be raised into being a great leader. He was a great leader. It doesn't matter that his background was a little bit messy. Well, you can go on and on and on about Winston Churchill, but here's a very famous quote from him. He says, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. What he's saying is that the people who sacrificed, the people who fought against the Nazis during this time frame, rescued humanity, rescued the whole world. So very few people putting their lives on the line in the grand scheme of things to preserve world, you know, preserve the, the world against Hitler and the Nazis. It does make me think a whole lot about my my current man crush, Volmore Zelensky. Oh, oh, right. oh, there. Oh, oh, got your attention there. Winston Churchill, President Zelensky of Ukraine. You have a man crush on a no, leader like no, that? No. You guys don't know. <laughs> so this is not just Swanson. I'm not the only one with a man crush on President. Wait, wait, I got a question. What do you, you mean by that? Like, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is I want to be like him. I want to emulate him. I want to be a leader like him. Or I wish I could even. Wait, 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 hang on, hang on. No, no, no. Explain it though. Like, say, you say your well, idol. Not well, your yeah. Man. So my 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 idol, Jeterius. Like, my idol. like, what do you mean by man crush? Like, you say it. Like, you look up to him. I admire him. Yeah. 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 Does that work? Am I Ryan Reynolds. You guys, you guys need to Urban Dictionary some stuff more often. All right. I digress. Yeah, actually, I do. I digress. It's not just me, all right? It's not just me in the world right now. A lot of people are comparing Winston Churchill to President Zelensky right now. Just like Winston Churchill was a strong leader in the time that his country was being bombed, he did not leave, he did not evacuate, he didn't give in to Hitler. Same thing, President Zelensky is not leaving Ukraine, he's not giving in to, uh, to, to Putin and the Russians, he's leading his people through this hard time. A lot of political cartoons could come from this, Churchill has a very famous speech where he says, we shall fight on the beaches. What he means is that every Briton, man, woman, or child, we will fight on our beaches for our lifestyle, for our country. We won't let Hitler come and take, our, take over our country. Well, Zelensky says, he said this famous, said, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. I'm staying here. I'm not leaving. Just send more ammo. So these two guys are very comparable to each other, and that is where we will pause to go to the restroom. So we're going to take our break. Bonos and bonos. Bonos and bonos, I think it was a...
I said we're praying for her, even though she ain't here. I wish she was 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 Man crush. They couldn't handle man crush. Had one, and if the kids were asleep, she would leave it in water and put it in there. That's good. <laughs> I'm for that. Could have done that to Brandon. That's important. Not everything. Yeah. Get a bottle yeah. of the old. I'll take one. This is the perfect side dowel rod, and I haven't found another one just like it. Went to Lowe's the other time, and I was going to get a couple more spares. And they were like, this. Can you just buy one and cut it? I got a question. Is your wife know about your manacle? Uh, I'm sure she does. 
you know, there's a reason I watch Fox News so I can see Baltimore with Lindsay. Wait, that's that. That's that. Hey, at least I got your attention. You can yeah. say that I got your attention. You got it. <laughs> All right, doing a bit of a long haul here, building up some context so we can talk about American involvement in the war. Next thing that happens in our story here is that Hitler does something real stupid. What do you think could be something real stupid based on what we've talked about so far? He's on a war. Try he's going to take over more. Huh? Try to take over more. Try to take over more is a great start. Who does he try to take over? Poland. Russia. Russia. Nah, Russia. not Barb. Say it. Russia. 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 He violates Russia. his non-aggression pact with Russia. And you can see that he goes from, now he's in Poland, he starts to invade into Russia. How dumb is that? Signs this non-aggression pact. But by breaking it, well, that means now Russia can turn loose on him, and that's pretty much exactly what happens. Uh, Germany breaks the non-aggression pact, invades the Soviet Union. Soviet Union uses a scorched earth policy, no prisoners, no hold, you know, no hold back. They're going to crush the Germans as fast as they can. Uh, and Germany moves on to several, they do move into Russia, they move into several cities, but you know what they're far away from? Capture. Their homeland. And when you're far away from your homeland, you run, out of, supplies. You run out of supplies. That's right. exactly Russia. what happened. If we learned nothing else in all of world history, we learned to never Russia. invade Russia in the winter. Never invade Russia in the winter. If you learn nothing else out of world history, at least you learned that. But you know what? Hitler didn't learn that, and that's exactly what he does. Yeah, now this is representative, right? It's showing the Russians pushing back the Nazi tanks. Ironically, in recent days, we've seen Ukrainians literally pushing back uh, Russian tanks. So it's kind of a flip of the script there. This is one of the cities that Hitler attacked and put under siege. It's called Stalingrad. It's named after Stalin. And what you see here is not soldiers, but civilians. Because the whole city was surrounded, and when you're surrounding a city, what are you trying to do? Starve them out, right? Out of food, out of water, out of ammo. So everybody was affected by the siege of Stalingrad, and this is a line of people. I think they're getting a line for bread and soup, or you know, bread and water. Uh, but here's what's super ironic: even though a million Soviets died, that's a big number. A million Soviets died. Yellow card. A million. A million Soviets died, but you know what the Germans did? surrendered because they were cold tired and hungry the germans they had losses as well and they surrendered even though they were the attackers you might think well why don't you just go back to germany they didn't have enough fuel to put in their trucks to go back to germany oh, yeah, so, so the germans surrendered the germans surrendered so in a way that's a big loss for hitler right there right because the russians demonstrated their strength and hitler lost so what they did they just stay there or they have to ask no, the they Russians? became their own prisoners so august through february august 42 through february 43 Germany, what they really wanted to seize was the oil fields that were in Stalingrad. It's always, you know, about money and resources. So it's oil fields. German troops surrendered to the Soviet <laughs> Union due to starvation and cold. All right. So that's just, we're not going to go too deep into that battle. That's just one more. Leads us to what's known as the Atlantic Wall. Now, this is on your page. And actually, this little picture is printed there. Might be a little hard to see what it is, which is why I'm going to explain it to you. Blue here is everything that Hitler currently owns is in charge of. So you can see now, look at this bold green line, this is Hitler's boundaries on the western edge of all of Europe. He does not have Great Britain. Great Britain, Britain is an island country, right? He hasn't crossed the water. He does not have Great Britain. He invaded Norway. He invaded Finland. A couple things we didn't really talk about. But from this, he has what's known as the Atlantic Wall. He is in control of the western edge of Europe. In order to liberate Europe, what the, uh, what the Allies are going to have to do, what the Americans are going to have to do, is penetrate the Western Wall, excuse me, the Atlantic Wall. Penetrate the Atlantic Wall. So the question will become, how do we penetrate the Atlantic Wall? Here's what I want you to write down. Hitler had masses defensive built up along Europe's western coast against invasion. I'm going to show you what his defenses look like in a couple of pictures here in just a second. And you're going to see how difficult it will be for the Allies to penetrate the Atlantic Wall. Devin? Huh? Uh, the question, white is neutral countries. 
So that means Sweden had stayed neutral, and Switzerland is always known to be neutral. I think it is very interesting that Switzerland's neutrality is right there in the middle of all the German held territory. Atlantic Wall, Hitler's massive defensive defense positions built along Europe's western coast against invasion, to defend against invasion. And this is where the Americans start to enter the story. We're going to see what it takes for our army to penetrate the Atlantic Wall. It's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot. So check this out. I think most everybody's done writing. This is what the Atlantic Wall looked like. These concrete bunkers, oh my these God. big anti-aircraft weapons. You could obviously put a lot of machine guns and soldiers around there as well. Here's another picture. Sometimes the geography alone was enough to be a defensive position. Look at this cliff face. Look at how steep that is. And then you put a bunker on top of that. Can you imagine being a foot soldier who's got to like scale that cliff face in order to attack the Germans? Yeah, so sometimes the geography alone. This is one of the biggest guns. Along the Atlantic that's Wall. Ships. Yeah, one of the large, yeah, that's right. So, battleships could be attacked. Airplanes could be attacked. Landing craft full of people could be attacked. It's going to take a massive invasion force to penetrate the Atlantic Wall. Here is, uh, here's the geography itself. This is along the coast, uh, the northern coast of France. These sheer cliffs, no chance for an invasion force to actually get through those. You couldn't climb those with hundreds of thousands of people and overwhelm the Germans. You get shot down. They can just drop rocks on you. Right? So sometimes the geography itself was enough. And again, just one more example of how many, uh, how many large cannons were out there. I know this one's up front, right in the foreground, but look, there's several along the way as well. So this is the Atlantic Wall. It's really going to take a lot for the Americans to break through the Atlantic Wall. I wonder how we do it. Brings me to a little event I like to call D-Day. D-Day is military <laughs> slang. Yeah, it stands for the. It stands for just like the day of the attack. There were actually a lot of D-Days in World War II, but this one is the most famous, and it gets known as D-Day. Right. A lot of times, this is called the longest day, or even the day of days as well. So the picture we're looking at here. This is President Eisenhower, and he's talking <coughs> to some American paratroopers the night before the attack. He's actually telling him, like, he is very aware, he's a good leader, he's very aware that his decision is going to impact the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. He wants the weather to be right. He wants the landing to be right. He wants everyone's equipment to be all working in order, all that kind of stuff. He's got to consider all these things before he gets to go ahead to the invasion. So here's what you want, I want you to write down about D-Day. Massive invasion of Europe planned by Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower. Normandy, France was selected as the best location. Amongst all the Atlantic Wall defenses, various levels of reconnaissance have determined that Normandy, France is potentially a place where the Allies can penetrate the Atlantic Wall. So I'm going to tell you all about D-Day here in just a second. Now, if you hear D-Day, we are referring to this attack. However, you may also hear it called the Normandy Invasion. That's based off of its location, the Normandy Invasion. And then in just a second, I'm going to change the screens and tell you one more thing. Its official military name was called Operation Overlord. So I'll put that on the screen so you can spell it, Operation Overlord. I think in terms of a test, we're probably not going to see the official military name, Operation Overlord. We're probably going to see it referred to as D-Day or the Normandy invasion. But because we're well-rounded historians and thinkers, I want you to know this whole story. Operation Overlord is also the official military name. So kind of could be referred to by any of these three names, and we're talking about the same thing. Next slide is going to give you, I think, just one more little data point I want you to write down. I kind of merged the slides a little bit. This, this invasion happens on, we don't memorize a whole lot of dates, but this is an important one, June 6, 1944. June 6, 1944 is when D-Day happens. So sorry, it's not on this screen either. Operation Overlord, make sure you got that jotted <coughs> down. Kind of hodgepodge in these slides just a little bit, my bad. June 6, Operation, June 6th, 1944. We don't memorize a whole lot of dates, but that is an important one. D-Day, the Normandy invasion, June 6th, 1944. Now Eisenhower, he is a you know very important man in, the, in World War II as for his generalship. He goes on to be, anybody? Agent President. What's he go on to be? President. 
president. Excellent. And I like to point out that he went to school at West Point, class of 1915. He actually served in World War I and then also in World War II. Something really notable about Dwight D. Eisenhower is that he was a very bad cadet. As a cadet at West Point, he served over 200 demerit hours. At West Point, the way you get punishment is they waste your time. What you actually have to do is you walk back and forth across what's known as the area. Because at West Point, time is valuable. Time for, your, hours. time for your school, time for your sports, sometimes just your personal <laughs> time. You don't have a whole lot of that. So the way they punish you is if you get demerits, you get marching hours. And literally you just waste your time by walking back and forth across this little patch of concrete. Well, Eisenhower was known as a very bad cadet, and he got over 200 marching hours. By comparison, Cadet Swanson's got two marching hours. So, I mean, that's because I was a little good two shoes and did all the right things. Here's what I want to give you on that you can be a bad cadet and still be president of the United States. You can have a messy past and still become a good leader, maybe even president of the United States. So, I know we point out a lot of West Pointers in this class. Dwight D. Eisenhower is one of them. At West Point to this day, there's a statue of Eisenhower. And one of the main buildings is named Eisenhower Barracks. There's also an Eisenhower <coughs> Hall. So Eisenhower goes on. He goes from being a bad cadet to being one of the most important graduates of the military academy uh, overall. All right, D-Day, a little bit more for you. So the invasion happens on June 6, 1944. I would say you probably take, if you've taken these notes, if, you know, if you've written down what I said so far, you're good on your notes, just listen. Just listen to me, okay? June 6, 1944. It happened through a lot of these landing craft filled with about 30, 35 people storming up to the beaches. They lower the ramp, and then the men start to run off. But yeah, as soon as the ramp was lowered, what happened? Bullets started flying. The Germans started shooting at them. So big, scary moment for a lot of people who were invading the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944. The troops land in France. Normandy is in France. I'm about to show it to you on a map. And from there, they push into Germany. Uh, it's the largest land and sea attack in history. And it is the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. Your notes say, what's the turning point battle in the European theater? D-Day. The Normandy invasion is the turning point battle in the European theater of war. There's still a lot of war to be fought. But it is that battle that turns the tide towards the eventual victory of the Allies. And it doesn't happen right away, but France is liberated. Belgium is liberated, and the rest of the territories that Hitler had conquered, they're all liberated. The Allies eventually go all the way till Hitler's home itself, right? The capital of Germany and the home of Hitler, uh, they liberate everything in between. So, well. what happened? so it's the beginning of the end. What they just liberate his whole country? They did. They eventually, con so they uh, secured Germany, and the next part of our history story is what happens to Germany after the war. We'll get so there. they just claim all that land? We'll get there. Them? We'll get there. We'll get there. Good question. We'll get there one step at a time. First, here's the step we're on, Slade. We've got to talk about the invasion of D-Day. Now, I want you to imagine this. What's uh, what's a favorite beach you like to go to? What are your favorite beaches? Daytona. Fernandina. 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 Sure. Jacksonville. Fernandina. Jekyll. Jekyll. Okay. So everybody imagine a beach, right? We've all been to the beach before. Let's say you go down that public boardwalk. You got your umbrella. You got your bag. You got your chairs. You get to the beach. You plop down your stuff. You're there, right? Beach day. You look to your left, you look to your right. About how far can you see? Um, Pretty far. Uh, maybe, maybe a mile, either direction. Even, you, know, if it's flat, you can see about a mile, either direction. Oh, no. It gets fuzzy off in the distance. I, I know, pretty far, but let me realistically, a mile ish, either direction. Uh, okay, it depends. So you're seeing. You're seeing about two miles of beach, depending on how fuzzy it is, or the you know the the haze, or the bend of the beach, whatever. About two miles worth of beach. Look at this right here. This is 50 miles worth of beach. This yeah. attack happened along 50 miles worth of beach. Not just your little beach vacation spot, right? When you plop your chair and you look left and right, this attack happened along 50 miles of beaches. Five different beachheads. You can see that the Americans spearheaded two of them, the Brits spearheaded two of them, and even the Canadians, that's the Canadian flag, they spearheaded one of these beaches. So it really was a team effort. It wasn't just raw, raw America all the way. It really was a team effort. And here's the strategy. Here's what they were trying to do. They wanted to roll up on the beach, 
knock out that portion of the Atlantic wall. So that means they had to take on the machine guns and those big guns and all the soldiers. But if they could secure the beach, then they could get the next mile. And if they had the next mile, then they could get the next 10 miles. Then they could start bringing in tanks. Then they could build an airstrip and they could land planes. Then they could keep all their supplies coming in, food and fuel and weapons. But it all starts at the beach. If we own the beach, we then can get the next mile, we then can get the next 10 miles, and what that leads to is liberating the rest of Europe. So that's the strategy. They weren't just rolling up on the beach for funsies. They were trying to own the beachhead in order to get the next mile, the next 10 miles, and on and on. Once the boats come in? Once the, once the Germans saw the boats coming? Like, yeah. See them, like, oh yeah, rat a tat tat. Definitely, they were under fire. I'm gonna show you a video clip here in just a second that shows what it was like. If you flip your page over, you'll see two different infographics. I'm not going to go over all those, oh, you but, showed us a movie. but you have those. Yep, you have those so that you can look at it. See how many people were involved, different countries, map there just a little bit. So I'm not going over those infographics. That's just kind of for your information if you want to look at it while I'm talking. Hang on. Let me explain this so we can get to the movie clip. Here's that 50 miles of beachhead, right? I told you it was five different beach landings at the same time. Here's something that's really important to the story. The Germans expected the attack to happen right here. And because they expected the attack to happen right here, say it again, they had most of their equipment right here. That's right, most of it. Now, there was still defense right here. And when I show you this video, you're going to be like, whoa, that was lightly defended. But most of their equipment was at this spot called Calais right here. And the reason for that is, look at that, that's a much shorter travel from the United Kingdom. The Germans assumed that the Americans and the Allies were going to take the shorter route. In the end, we took the longer route, and that was that led to the success. So, because of this pretend landing, and the Americans actually made it look like we were going to land at Calais, because of this deception right here, it opened up the door for success down here. So that's well, they started uh, stacking equipment. The Americans, the Allies, started stacking equipment on this portion of, uh, of the United Kingdom, made it look like we were going to attack at Calais, when in fact. Where actually the real attack was starting down here. So sometimes I think about these guys. They actually didn't get in on the attack, but they played a very important part by deceiving the Germans overall. So because of that deception, it was successful down here. Brandon? And uh, what she was saying, they also actually they used some of the big cannons mm -hmm. to actually destroy the things that were carrying That's right. people. A lot of individual stories. I'm kind of giving you that big overall picture. A whole lot of individual stories as well. A couple pictures, and then I'm going to show you the movie clip. So imagine this. Imagine you're 19 years old. You're on this landing craft, and this is what's in front of you. Look at those cliffs. Obviously, there's something smoking. There's a whole lot of bullets flying. How you feel? Scared. Scared. A little bit scared. Now, now the ramp is down. Now the ramp is down, and the bullets are flying inside your boat. How do you feel? Terrified. We go from scared to terrified. Now you're in the water, and you're wading ashore. What do you think awaits you on the shore? No idea. No idea. I love this picture because it's actually from the ground at D-Day. There are not many photographs that survive. The water damaged a lot of film and a lot of cameras, but this is one of the few pictures that survived. Taken in black and white, but it's been colorized. I think that almost makes me feel like I'm there. I really love this picture. Next picture here kind of represents how the bigger equipment would come onto the beach. This shows, again, just kind of shows what, what awaits you on the shore. Those cliffs, guys, that tears me up every time I look at that. As a foot soldier, I'm an infantry foot soldier, it, it blows my mind to think about guys having to scale those cliffs. This shows how organized the attack was. It takes a whole lot for people to get, like, you guys can't walk in a straight line down the hallway. Imagine these landing craft lining up ducks in a row for miles on end to deliver the landing force. An amazing piece of human accomplishment to make that happen. And then this would have been a day or two after the battle or after that first landing when all the heavy equipment started coming in. So like I said, they take the beachhead, then they take the next mile. This is the portion where all that heavy equipment started coming in. And just one more example of what it would have looked like on the beachhead on that day. What we're gonna do right now, and the reason I talk kind of fast right there, I'm gonna put you on Normandy Beach. I'm going to put you, take your brain right now, June 6, 1944. And what you're about to see is a movie. Some of the characters are not exactly true to history, but
but the equipment, the sounds, the tactics, the storming of the beach, that all happened, of course. That is true to history. So not every character represents someone that was on the beach that day, but the story is a beautiful representation, a harrowing representation of what it was like on that day. I will give you the permission, if you wish, to put your head down because you don't want to see the gra it's graphics, it's yeah, graphic violence. But I would encourage you to embrace the story, try to be there, and see what these people did to free the world of Hitler. This is what it cost. This is what it took to free Europe of Hitler. And arguably, if he hadn't been stopped, I kind of wonder what would have happened to all of us in the world today. Would Hitler be in charge? Would the Nazis dominate the planet? Who knows? So let's watch and see. Nazis could be around. And Mr. Swanson. Volume's pretty good, but keep it down so that you can embrace it. Mr. Swanson. Yes. That one picture of where the they actually also have some active Omaha Beach, that's one of the American beaches. See that landing craft like you just talked about? Everybody having that quiet moment, some for religion, some for whispering. No time. <laughs>
Maybe took you there a little bit. Sight, sounds. I feel like I can almost smell it sometimes. Very accurate movie clip. The movie came out in 1998 called Saving Private Ryan. And while the Tom Hanks character, he's not exactly a true historical person, the story, at least this opening scene, is very, very well done from a movie perspective. In fact, a lot of World War II veterans and D-Day veterans who watched this clip Many of them had to leave the theater because they couldn't handle what they were seeing. It was so lifelike for them. Others who could say, you know, they were able to handle and watch it, they were able to give the, the feedback that, wow, that's exactly what it was like. They were amazed that the director was able to get it so lifelike because he interviewed so many people, he read so many books and reports and such like that. So Saving Private Ryan, a very accurate film overall. Another story, the telling of the D-Day uh, invasion, the Normandy invasion, is this is a 10-part miniseries called Band of Brothers. It came out uh, probably 20, plus, 20 or so years ago, 19, or 2002 or so. Anyway, this actually is a much truer to life story. Started with a book, and the book was historically factual, accurate. And then, of course, anytime you make a movie, you got to combine characters and change things up just a little bit. But Band of Brothers, very accurate. Tells the story of the D-Day landings and then more. It shows soldiers fighting their way across Europe. Now, let me finish with these couple of pictures here. So, how many people do you think died on the beaches at Normandy on that day? Thousands. Thousands, for sure. There were 4,414 Allied deaths. And that's kind of hard to track. Like, if you died the next day or two weeks later. That's still a lot. The statistic is kind of hard to track. It was a lot. By comparison, I'll give you the enemy deaths. There were between 9,000 and 12,000 Germans who died. So a lot of people died on the beaches on that day. You could probably guess that from the chaos that you were seeing on the screen. This is something that happens on the beaches of Normandy every anniversary. Every June 6th, 
this art group comes out, and what does it look like? What can you tell is going on here? They're like bodies. Bodies. What they do is they stencil into the sand human shapes to represent how many people died on the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944. It's kind of artistic, right? It's an artistic movement. It's hard. It's kind of sucks punches you in the gut to think about how many people died on the beaches of Normandy at that time. Now, here's the question. Why? Why did we storm the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944? So that this could happen. This is the before and the after. Before, on the right-hand side of your screen, you see soldiers on the beach. But today, these beaches are free, and when life is returned to normal, you is see it a and soccer on the beach. Here's another before and after. Before, soldiers marching through this town. Now, then and now is a good way to think of it. Now, it's returned to regular commerce, vacation, all that kind of stuff. Then, this would be several days after the invasion, when the beachhead was built up a little bit more. Soldiers are marching into battle, but now, kind of off in the distance, you see cars parked in the distance, now it's just a regular beach. Then, rubble in the streets, bombed out, dangerous, now has returned to commerce, shopping, dad holding his kid's hand. Then, it was a bunker, part of the Atlantic Wall. Now, here's actually a cool little then and now. That bunker is still there. The bunker is still there to this day. Now, today we'd call, probably call it like a museum piece. You can still go to this beach. There is the bunker. It's kind of like a reminder of what happened. Grandma, grandpa, they're holding hands. They're walking on the beach. But it's hard to walk past that bunker without thinking about what happened. And I hope that we will behave in a way that it never happens again. Then the church is bombed out. Now it's been restored. Then soldiers on the beach. Now kids are on the beach. Then it was a camp full of prisoners. Now it has returned to regular agriculture, regular place for regular place for uh, um, yeah, regular place for farming and such like that. So here's what I want to do for you. I know the bell's about to ring. That last question on your notes talks about Theodore Roosevelt Jr. Instead of telling you the story, I'm giving you this handout. I know you got to pack up and you're going to go home. I want you to read this story about Theodore Roosevelt Jr. I want you to answer that last little question. I want you to think about what it means to lead from the front because it's a pretty cool story. Look at the name of his truck. Why is that cool? Rough uh, yeah, why is that pretty cool? His dad, his dad was a part of the Rough Riders. So I'm not telling you the story in class. I'm giving you the page here to read about it and think about it and answer that last little question about Theodore Roosevelt Jr. So hey, thank you. We took it right to the bell. Go ahead and pack up and get ready. I and if you have any questions about the clip, if you need to talk about anything you saw, we can talk about it wherever you got. So well, also, like I've, I've seen that movie like a bunch of times. I'm listening, Jess. Yes.